Good morning, City Church. Good morning. You can stay seated. We'll stand in a few minutes for prayer, but let me tell you something. The Spirit is already moving. Woo, and it's powerful. Lord, thank you, Jesus. And isn't it just a beautiful day outside? Man, thank you, God, for waking us up this morning. You know, we always open up with the needs, and you're going to see them on the screen. I do know that uh, Harriet Brubaker, we've been praying for her. She did have her heart surgery. That's pastor's aunt, and the surgery went great. I think the last report, she was up talking, doing her thing, because that's God. Thank you, Jesus. Continued prayer for Holly's uncle, Joe McFarland. Um, we're just going to continue and pray that that lesion that they found on him is nothing and that we he will have that transplant. God gets the glory always. Always. Oh, God. We're going to continue to pray for Anthony. Um, Gannett, I can't see. Gannett, Garnett. Garnett. Uh, Dan Jackson, who is Pastor Danita's brother. Um, Jack Ross. Brother Larry Chavis, he, he had his surgery, and that went well, so continued prayers for him to heal up. Let's pray for Pastor. Pastor John has not been feeling well this morning, and you know when you don't see him out and about, it just does something. You know what I mean? So we're going to pray that he feels better. Oh, Pastor, feel better. Feel better. Oh, Jesus, thank you. So I want to just say that um, for myself, I always have faith that my kids will one day watch these services. So with that being said, and I know some of you saw my, uh, my praise report over my, my daughter, Shantae. Well, Shantae, I just want to say that today makes 41 days. Mama's still counting. Matthew 5, 14 and 15. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Now, with that being said, and just by a show of hands, how many of us have been through something and the world tells us there's not going to be a good outcome to this. There's no way there's going to be a good outcome to this. How many of you out there have seen God make a way when there was no way? Okay. So with that being said, that light, we are the light. And like I said last week, this world does not know God. And it may only know God through us. So we don't have time to let our shine dim in any way. But you know what? Every time that God brings us through something, and I'm just speaking to myself, why the next time do we still have doubt? If he brought, it, brought us through it before, won't he do it again? And I feel like every time that we let doubt in, it dims our light a little bit more little bit more and if we let that light go out not only are we lost but the world is lost oh god help us lord help us lord first thessalonians 5 16 and 18 says be joyful always give thanks in all circumstances be joyful always pray continually give thanks in all circumstances for this is god's will for you in jesus christ and it doesn't say give thanks when things are awesome, when things are great in your life. It says give thanks in all circumstances, right? I know Pastor has said it time and time again. It speaks volumes. If you come in here and you're shouting and you're praising when things are good, that's one thing. But when, when those trials, when you're facing a trial and you can still come in here and shout his name and praise his name and give him thanks that's real worship that's real worship and I know I know there's some days that we don't feel like getting out of the bed much less getting up and thanking God do it anyway 
I know there's some, some Sundays that we don't feel like getting up and coming to church. I just do it anyway. And I know that even today, some of us may have come through those doors, barely standing, weight of the world on your shoulders. I don't care if you have to crawl to the altar. Do it anyway, because you are in the right place at the right time to get reignited. Just give it to God and let him show you what he can do. And I've had a verse in my mind over and over and over for the past few weeks. And I have to be honest, maybe it's because I know that my, my kids at least know this verse because it was in the movie Footloose. Um, but it says, Ecclesiastes 3, 4, and 5, there is a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and there's a time to to dance. Well, guess what? Through the morning, through the weeping, whoo, Jesus, I say that we dance. No matter what this world throws at us, we dance. We dance. Oh, Father God, in the name of Jesus, as we stand and give him glory, stand with me. Father God, oh, Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We know we can't take a another step or another breath without you, Lord Jesus. And we're so thankful, Father God, and so humble. Lord, forgive us when, forgive us our sins. Forgive us when we doubt. Forgive us when we let the, the world take away our light, Lord Jesus, that you have given us. Help us to walk. When we are in that fiery furnace, Lord, we should walk the faith knowing that you're in it with us, Lord Jesus. Oh God, let us have that faith so that the world that this world does not know you. Let them see us and see how we go through these trials. Oh, God, and we pray that they'll come and they'll want to know you, Father God. You've heard the needs. You've heard the names. You know every unspoken request, Father God. Move in the way only you can move. And if there is somebody out there that does not know you, Lord, if there's somebody out there that their light is just gone, Father God, if there's somebody out there with that need, Lord Jesus, let them know that it only takes a touch of the hem of your garment to change their life, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, Jesus' name, Jesus' Bless the name of Jesus. Come on, let's give him a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, can we all clap our hands? Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, let's lift up the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let's magnify him. Come on, let's all do it together. Come on, every hand lifted, oh God. Come on. Every voice lifted. Come on, let's bless him. Hallelujah. Come on, we enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Hallelujah. We have praise on our lips. Hallelujah. We have praise in our hearts. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you, O oh God. We bless your name, O oh God. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's worship him. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, let's lift up the name of Jesus. Come on, can you lift up the name of Jesus? Can you lift your hands? Can you lift your voice? Can you bless the name of Jesus for yourself? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We 
serve a good God? We serve a good God? Hallelujah! We serve a mighty God. Hallelujah! We serve a mighty God. Just a few more minutes. Come on, just a few more minutes. It's okay. It's okay to open your mouth and bless your God. It's okay to lift your hands and bless your God. It's okay to get comfortable in his presence. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor and say, it's good to see you in the house of the Lord today. Hallelujah. Look at somebody else and say, it's good to see you in the house of the Lord today. Hallelujah. 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 Good to see each and every one of you. For those that are in Sunday school, they're already doing the Sunday school summer classes. So if we have somebody that's inside here, a kid that's inside here that would like to go ahead to the classes in the back, go right on ahead, okay? They're, the kids' church, they're already starting. We have Queen Bean Lynn over here. <laughs> so follow the queen. <laughs>
Hallelujah. Can we praise him like he is glorious? Can we worship him like he's marvelous? Wonderful, hallelujah, glorious, marvelous. Like there's something that just stirs in you when you start speaking to him about all of his qualities and his attributes. When you link your thought to a memory of something that he's done that's been extraordinary, that you know only God could have done, it just makes those words just pour forth out of you, hallelujah. Because he's been so good. He's been so good. Hallelujah, Jesus. Grateful for any opportunity we have that we can meet with him. Thank you, Jesus. We dare not move without you. We want you in this place. Lord, you're the reason why.
to meet you here today. Hallelujah. We want him to meet us here today. Hallelujah. 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 Because anything can happen in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh God. Hallelujah.
with lifted hands we're ready for a brand new demonstration
the moment that he wants it. Y'all see those words up there? Anything can happen. All it takes is just a little bit of faith. Just a little bit of, of turning up your head and acknowledging the fact that he can do all things if you just ask. If you just open your heart, if you just open your mind and submit yourself to what God wants to do in your life, all you have to do is say, God, yes. Yes, Lord, to your will, God. Yes, Lord, to your way, oh God. Yes, Lord, to what you're doing in my life. Yes, Lord. I know it hurts right now. I know it, it doesn't feel good right now. I know it's sticky and I know, I know the ends aren't meeting, God. I know this depression is settling in. I know this anxiety is building up. I know all of these things are happening and this sickness is running rampant through my body and through my life, God. But yes, Lord, to your will. Yes, Lord, to your way because all things work together. Anything can happen. Let's go ahead and do that a little bit longer. He deserves our praise this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What a wonderful presence of the Lord is in this place. Anything can happen. You may say, what is anything? Well, whatever you need. Whatever you need today. Whatever you came here in search of. It's here because he's here. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we said earlier, if you've came in a little bit late and you have a child, we have our City Kids Kids Church has started today. And so from now, I think until August the 6th, um, whenever you get here, if you could sign your child in and then take them to the fellowship hall. And then please be sure to make sure you go back when it's over and pick them up because we won't be just letting them out, okay? We have to have an adult drop them off and pick them up, amen? We don't want them sleeping on the pews overnight. We don't want to take one home. We would like for you to pick them up in the appropriate time. Um, we do have a few announcements this morning I'm going to go over. I want to say that Pastor is here, but he's not been feeling well this week, and I couldn't make him stay home, so here he is. Um, but we're thankful Pastor Danita has offered to step in today and, and preach for us and continue his series. I'm thankful that we have people that we can call on when we need something. Amen. I'm thankful for the, the body of Christ that is strong and is encouraging. Amen. Amen. Um, our offering, our giving instructions are on the screen. Um, next Sunday is our building fund offering. Remember that. Our Renew, Rebuild, Restore offering is every um, first Sunday of the month. So don't forget that. Um, you can give online. You can give text to give. Or you can give in the offering basket on your way out. And we thank you for your giving. We would not be where we are today if it weren't for your giving. Amen. Amen. So life groups, life group West Ashley and life group North Charleston and Somerville are on a summer break. Can we say amen? <laughs> it was wonderful. We, we had a great time of being together, but we needed a little break. And so we're doing that during the summer. Life group, our young adult life group still have a couple more lessons and they are meeting um, on Monday nights at the Smith's home. It's hard to say that, but the Smith's home, they'll be meeting on Monday nights, I think, for the next two Mondays, two Mondays to go. So if you are a young adult and you would like to join them, please do so. It's not too late. Um, as I said, Kids City Kids Kids Church started today, and they are in a competition already um, the, between the kings and the queens. 
So if you guys want to make sure you rate, go ahead and clean out, do some spring cleaning, spring summer cleaning of your goods, and make sure that your king or queen brings them. They already have a box in the fellowship hall labeled. And so all of these goods will go towards, I believe, favorite our our food, yes, our food pantry, our food cupboard. So we join together with the kids church this this summer. Amen. Um, there is a meeting after service today for our connect groups. Connect groups are a are groups that meet during the summer. If whatever you're interested in, we have I think a little bit of everything, and we want you to come and be a part of connect groups. If find your the one that you're passionate about and go ahead and join. There'll be a meeting about that after service today in the library with Pastor John. Oh, not in the library, right there. Well, you didn't say, so we made an executive decision and said the library. <laughs> but he says right here, if you'll meet him right there, he will go ahead and um, see who all's interested in that. <clears throat> new Life, New Members class begins Thursday, July 13th at 7 p.m. Please sign up on the Church Center app or in the foyer. If you are new to City Church and you'd like to be a part or be um, to volunteer to do any activity in our church, we ask that you attend this class. It starts this th- or Thursday, July 13th at 7 p.m. It will be in um, the library if you come to this location or you can join us via Zoom. Um, and please sign up for that. South Carolina District Spanish Conference is July 6th through the 8th at World Harvest Church on Montague Avenue. Thursday and Friday at 7 p.m., Saturday at 10 a.m. We went last year, I believe, and, man, they have a full band, and it is hopping. Yes. It is hopping. So if you have any, if you want to, you don't have to be Spanish to, to enjoy. So just, they do speak Spanish, though, during the whole service, but they do have translators for you to wear. Back to School Rally is Friday, August 11th at 7 p.m. Are for our youth and hyphen ages, so that would be 12 and up. Um, they are having that service at the Sanctuary of Praise in Anderson, South Carolina, and they're going to have an information meeting after service next Sunday for those parents that would like to meet our youth committee. They want to give you that information. We want to have a good crowd go this year. Amen. And so our next song is um, Hosanna, Be Lifted Higher. And I was going to read a scripture, but I didn't bring my phone with me, so I don't have my Bible. But I was going to read Matthew 21, 9 through 11, where they came together when Jesus was walking, or riding on a donkey, and they sang Hosanna to him. And Hosanna means save us. It's a prayer. It's a plea for help. It's a declaration of the need, or a need, for salvation. And it's a request for freedom. And so as Jesus was coming by on a donkey, they were singing, Hosanna, Hosanna. But they were really saying, I need you. I need freedom. I need deliverance. We say that hallelujah is a song of praise, and that's true. And sometimes people sing Hosanna is a song of praise. But Hosanna is a prayer. Hosanna, be lifted up, not just in this place today, but in my life. Be lifted up because I need you. I need you. It's a declaration of freedom. I need freedom. Do you need it? I need it. So why don't you worship with us as we sing that song this morning. Amen.
just celebrate him right there as the king of glory, as the one that's high and lifted up, as the one who still sits on the throne with all power in his hands. That's enough to celebrate him for. That's enough to give him glory for. That's enough to give him honor for. He's the only one worthy. He's the only one worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He's so worthy. He's so worthy. He's so worthy. Thank you, Jesus. He's worthy of anything that we have that we can give him. He's worthy of that and so much more. So we don't want to hold back on the praises that belong to him alone because he is worthy. He's worthy and deserving of every praise. And sometimes the enemy would cause us to want to close our mouths and not acknowledge his worthiness. Or like even the last song that we sang, when we're singing about how, you know, we're declaring some things. We're declaring his glory. We're declaring healing. We're declaring his power. We can declare a thing the Bible says, and that allows our faith to be increased. It lets our ears begin to hear what our heart should start resonating. And, and it should speak to say that, you know, God is still the one on the throne. And it quells every doubt. It squashes the noise that goes on in our heads when we acknowledge and declare that he is God and that beside him there is no other help. And when we cry, Hosanna, save us, as it was so beautifully brought out by our first lady, it's a prayer all in itself, those one, two-word prayers that Dr. Williams talked about. It's where we can begin to just say, God, I need you. Save me, God. Help me, God. And he hears and responds to those prayers. And so I thank the Lord this morning. How many of you love him? Just how many love him? God, I just love him this morning because he is so good and he's so worthy and deserving of everything we have to give him, even our brokenness. Did y'all know that he wants that too? The broken pieces, you know, instead of us trying to patch it all together and fix it up and then, okay, God, I'm going to come to you now and present it to you. He's like, no, just bundle up all the pieces, put them in a little tote bag, bring them to me. <laughs> he didn't ask us to fix it up and make it look pretty. That's his job, right? He just wants us to bring it. Just bring it. Glory to God. And so this morning, we come before you, as it's already been stated, we're standing in the stead of our pastor this morning, and thank God so much for this wonderful man of God and, and for the work that he does here and how he leads us, amen, because he is truly a blessing to this house, and we honor him. And we consider it a privilege whenever we have an opportunity to just come alongside and help any way that we can. And what you're going to see this morning is a demonstration, like Sister uh, Angela said, of how the members work together, right? So the message is from the pen of our pastor, but it was downloaded to him by the Holy Ghost. And I'm just going to be the vessel that delivers it, right? <laughs> but we're putting this thing together. Amen. And God is going to get the glory in this place. Glory to God. I kind of feel like, because Pastor had already done all the prep and all the work, and he was just like, and I was talking to him Friday, and he couldn't even make it through the conversation. He was just coughing so bad. He was like, that's the only thing I'm a little nervous about is that I might end up coughing all the way through this. And so we're like, that's all right. We got you. No problem. But I feel like the kid in class, right, that got somebody's notes. <laughs> you know, the smart kid in class, and you're like, let me see your paper. Yeah. <laughs> Let me copy off of you. So I feel like I've got the notes from the smart kid this morning. And so I'm going to do the best I can with what the Lord has given. But I do honor the spirit of the Lord this morning. And I thank God for our pastor. And I thank God for just how the Lord has been using him to bring out this series. We're in lesson three or sermon number three of a four-part series on the altars of Abraham. And today we're going to be looking at the altar of peace. Somebody say the altar of peace. I don't know about you all, but we need some more altars of peace, right? We need to build those altars. We need to erect those altars. We need to find those altars because we need more peace. 
as we can look around us and we see the deterioration of our country and we see so many different things happening in social media and in the news, and it would just really make you discouraged if that's the only source of information that you had. It would really make some of us just not even get out of bed in the mornings if we had to deal with all the stuff all the time. And, and thankfully, we have filters that we've learned to put in place, right? We know sometimes just turn off the show, just turn off the news, just, just turn off the radio. We know to do some of those things just to guard our minds, guard our minds a little bit. But I thank God because he gives us his peace, and he calls us to be peacemakers, in this world of chaos, we need people that will be willing to stand up and say, you know what, for the sake of peace, what can we do? How can we, how can we get this thing together for the sake of peace? Now, just as a brief review, uh, we know that for the last two lessons, we've been talking about the altar of visitation. That was our first message. And we learned in this message that by faith, Abram believed and obeyed God when the Lord told him to leave his kindred and family to journey into the land that God would show him. And in fact, because of his faith, the Lord imputed it or counted it to Abraham as righteousness. Abraham lived like he believed the promise of God, and an altar of faith was built in the place where the Lord had visited him. Abraham had a promise that he would never live to see. How many of y'all know that? Abraham never lived to see the promise that was made to him. And indeed, when he died, he died in a land where he was still a foreigner, but it was his. It was already his. Now, the next sermon that we had, which was last week, our second altar that we looked at was the altar of the name of the house of God. And last week in our second message on the altars, we learned that Abraham built an altar named Bethel in the promised land. And Bethel means the house of God. Somebody say the house of God. The house of God. One of the takeaways from last week for me is that it's important that when you have a covenant or an agreement that it be signed with a name. How many of you all, if you bought a house, did they just let you just slip in there and here's your keys? No, you had to sign a bunch of papers, right? Sister Stephanie knows about that. <laughs> you got to sign. You better bring your extra writing hand and another good pen because you're going to be there for a while, right? Every covenant, every agreement, it's only official. It's only um, something that can be held up in a court of law if there is a name. And that's why we baptize in the name, or when we enter into a baptism, we're entering into a covenant with God in which the name of Jesus is applied over our lives. And in so doing, our sins are washed away or they're remitted. And last Sunday, we had the privilege of baptizing Miss Jordan in Jesus' name back there after service on Sunday. And then it was just beautiful to see how she was taking on that covenant name of Jesus and her sins were being washed away, remitted, and left in that water. And I thank God and I give him the praise because that. That is part of that covenant that we have when we apply that name and our sins are removed. And we also learned that just because we have a promise, it doesn't mean that our faith won't be tried or that we won't have trials and learning opportunities, right? <laughs> like learning opportunities. That's the nice way to say it. Even in our promised land, we can still experience doubt and fear. And how many know that famines can even happen even in our promised land? We saw that Abraham's faith wavered just a bit last Sunday, and he ended up fleeing into Egypt. He ended up lying about his relationship with his wife, Sarah, his wife, and ultimately they made it out of Egypt, and they made it out of Egypt significantly wealthier than they went in. But it was through lies and deception, and who knows if some of the stuff of Egypt, like the extensive wealth that eventually made it difficult for him and Lot to share space together, or maybe even the potential acquiring of Haggai, the Egyptian servant, who they later used to try to bring about God's plan, but in man's way, right? How many, if you start thinking about all those things that they acquired and got out of Egypt, but these probably weren't the best things, and it led to some trouble later on. Maybe she came along during that jaunt into Egypt, and it leaves us to wonder what would have happened if they had stayed around that altar, if they'd stayed around the promise, around the house of God, in the promised land, even when things got hard. What would have happened even when things got hard if they just held on to their promise and stayed right there? But sometimes, like many of us, we tend to want to try to find the out. We want to find an easy way. We want to try to find some relief. And so we start moving and tipping off into places that we probably shouldn't go. But how much differently could their story have played out? 
It was noted last week so beautifully by our pastor that while in Egypt, there isn't record of Abraham building an altar there. And it could have been because in Egypt, perhaps Abraham felt like he'd found everything that he needed and he didn't have to depend as much on God. And while God does extend his grace to us, there's always going to be a consequence for sin. How many of you know that? There's always a consequence. Even though God's grace and mercy brings us out and brings us to another place, there's still going to be some consequences that follow sin. And so we see that Abraham has left Egypt, and he's once again headed back to Bethel. And this is where we pick up this morning with the third of Abraham's four altars, the altar of peace. Father, we bless your name this morning, and we give you praise. God, we thank you right now, Lord, for just sealing your word down in the hearts of your people, God. And as we minister, Lord, to your people, Lord God, from you, Lord God, I pray that your spirit, oh God, would have free course. Lord, open up our understandings, God. Illuminate, Lord God, our minds so that we can see, Lord, what your word has to say, that we may apply it to our lives, and that we can be the peacemakers that you've called us to be. Lord, this world is hurting, oh God, and there's need of reconciliation, God. There's a need for those, Lord God, that will set aside personal preferences, Lord God, and desire, Lord, to be formed after you and in your image, Lord, that we can help bring about reconciliation in this world. Use us, O oh God, to be vessels of honor, fit for your use, and we bless you for it, God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So today we're looking at the altar of peace, and I would invite you to look at Genesis chapter 13, verses 5 through 11. We're going to read that from the New King James Version. And it talked about how they left Egypt and how they were now heading back into the promised land. They came back to the house of God. They came back to that altar. Lot also, starting at verse number five, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And now the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So Abram said to Lot, please, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are brethren. We're family. There, there shouldn't be this beef between us. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. And it says that Lot lifted up his eyes and he saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So this land that he was looking at was situated right where the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were. And we understand the depths of sin that, uh, that lived in those cities. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go toward Zoar. And then Lot chose for himself and that's, that's something that we should note. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Now, initially, when the Lord gave Abram the, the instruction to leave your family, leave your kindred, leave this land, and go to a place that I will show you, that was a directive for Abraham. Now, Lot came along as well. And it could be that maybe Lot was considered to be more like a son sort of to Abraham, you know, just given their, their relationship. And, you know, we, we have a, a nephew that's dear to my husband and I. And my husband, you know, he pours a lot of time and attention to him. And we call him his nephew son. You know, it's like you're my nephew, but you're kind of like my son, so you're my nephew son. So that's kind of how Lot and Adam, uh, Abraham, probably were. They had this close connection. But now we find that it's, it's time for them to have to separate. They've gotten these things from Egypt, and now they're, they're so um, abundant. And, they, and, and even Lot being in the presence of Abram, you know, the promise was given to Abram that he would be fruitful and the Lord would bless him. But Lot had kind of attached himself, and so he kind of got some of those, those byproducts of the blessings as well. Sometimes it, the promise doesn't even have to be for you, but if you attach yourself to somebody that has a promise, you're going to come out pretty good too. Amen? So Lot kind of understood that. But there is a detrimental effect to the decisions that Lot made. When the verse 11 says, then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan. Sometimes what seems like the best decision isn't. And sometimes if we move into decisions without inquiring of the Lord, it doesn't even give a record that Lot ever built an altar the way that Abram did. So Lot 
maybe going under his own thoughts and influence, he looked out and he saw the plain that it was well watered. And he says, you know, there's going to be plenty of resources here for my cattle and my herdsmen. And, and this is a great place that we can live. And it doesn't even say that Lot deferred to the fact that Abram was the elder. That maybe, you know, in their society and, and even in, during their time, you know, it would have been probably the better thing for him to give Abram the preference and say, you know what, you, no, no, uncle, you know, I, all these things came because of the promise that God gave you. Lot didn't do that. He says, okay, well, if you're going to tell me to choose, then I'm going to choose what I think is the biggest and the best. And he started moving in that direction. But the thing about it is when you look further down in the story, later on, you'll see that Lot ended up getting himself into a sticky situation out there in Sodom and Gomorrah. He got so close pitching his tent there. He got so close that some of that Sodom and Gomorrah started getting into him as well. Again, moving without the counsel of the Lord. He barely escaped with his life. He loses his wife. He loses his sons-in-law. His daughters had behaved inappropriately with him. All these different things. And Abraham ended up having to stand in the gap to plead for Lot and say, God, please have mercy. When the angels were getting ready to come and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, please have mercy. I know that my, my people are there. My nephew's son is over there. I'm going to need you to, to just hold up on your wrath here a little bit. And so Abraham ended up having to intercede on behalf of Lot without Lot even realizing it. And it just goes to show that maybe there should have been a little bit more forethought for Lot before he made this decision without the counsel of the Lord. Lot didn't consult the Lord concerning this life-changing decision. And I just want us to think about that this morning. How many life-changing decisions do we have to make? How many things are we called on to make a decision about with our children, with our families, with our jobs, whether to stay in a marriage or move out of a marriage? All these different things, life-changing decisions. How many of us are counseling with the Lord? Or does it just feel good or feel like we should move in a certain direction and so we just kind of go with the flow? Now, Abram, on the other hand, because there's two people in this situation, Abram was the one, he was the peacemaker. He took what land was left. He did not assert his right and say, you know, I am the patriarch. I'm the one who brought us out here because of the promise I had from the Lord. I'm the one that's built these altars, and I've done all these different things. You know, I, I should be the one to choose first. He didn't pull rank. He didn't say, well, you know, I have a word from the Lord. <laughs> you know, people do that sometimes when they want you just to not talk about whatever it is that they're deciding on doing. And, and they just think they're going to shut down the whole argument by saying, but, but, but I have a word from the Lord. You know, the, the Lord spoke to me and he said this, that, or the other. And that's kind of code for don't mess with me about it. <laughs> don't ask me any questions. I'm good over here. Okay. So Abram didn't do that. He already knew the promise that he had, and he was confident in the promise of God in his life. That even giving Lot the option to say, you choose first, you take what you think is right, and I'll just take what's left. He didn't realize the fact that God was still in that moving on his behalf. He already had a promise from God, so he had nothing that he had to worry about, about fear of losing anything, because he already had a promise. Some of us are quaking and shaking when God tells us to move in a certain direction, and when things don't line up the way that we think they should, we're like, well, I don't know if God told me. I, I'm, I'm doubting now. I don't know if this was really God, but you got to hang on to the promise that God has given us. And no matter how it takes a turn or a shift, we have to still trust the God of the promise that if he brought us to it, he will bring us through it. So he didn't lose the leverage that he could have, <laughs> but I have a word from God. But rather than escalate the strife and tension with his own claims, Abram gave a kind word. And he just said, listen, I don't want there to be any strife. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. And if you go to the right, I'll go to the left. He was the peacemaker. Proverbs chapter 15, verses 1 through 2, as we deviate just a little bit, it says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Stirring it up, right? The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. That's a, that's a heavy indictment. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. You just speak all your mind. You just say whatever you want to say, whatever gratifies this flesh, whatever seems good in the moment to say, I'm going to just say it. People that are quick with the tongue and they don't take up an account of their words and how those words will have an effect on other people. 
So let's see what happens after Abram made peace with Lot. When we look at Genesis chapter 13 again, and we now look at verse number 14 through 18. And it says, And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, so we see that God is now speaking to Abram again. Once Lot has separated, once it's just Abram and God, God speaks to him again. And he says, lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. Wow. He had a promise from God. For all the land which you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. And he goes on to say in 16, and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth. So that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Wow. That's a big promise from a big God. And he says, arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. And then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the Terebinth trees of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. So he moves his tent, and he goes and he dwells right there in Hebron, and he built an altar to the Lord immediately after he got his promise, immediately after God clarified some things for him. He moves his tent so that he can build yet another altar to the Lord. And this is the altar of peace. God renewed his covenant words with Abram and he believed. God visited Abram and clarified his promise even more after he made peace. Now, he'd already had a promise before this incident with Lot, before the strife entered in, before there was some infighting and bickering. But when he set his mind and said, you know what, this is, this is chaotic. We can't continue living like this. Let me make peace. Let me separate. And only when he made peace did God visit Abram and clarify his promise even more. Everyone can go to where God is calling you to. You don't have to fall out with them. And you don't have to be ugly, but everybody can't go with you. When God is taking you a place, when he's moving you, when he's leading you someplace, and that promise is for you, don't try to take a whole gaggle of people with you. Because first of all, they're not going to get it. And they can slow you down and hinder your progress in the Lord. But if you will just hold the promise that you have and understand who's the one who gave you the promise, you don't have to fall out with anybody. You don't have to be ugly, but you can make peace a priority. And when you do so, God will bless you. When you make peace a priority, God will bless you. The Bible calls us to be peacemakers. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. It says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. I want to be a son of God. I want to be a daughter of the king. And I can only do that when I'm a peacemaker. We're called to be peacemakers. Even in our life group study that we just wrapped up in our spiritual formation, and it was our, our study on more like him and, and being spiritually conformed and forming ourselves in his image and in his likeness, conforming our ways to his ways, our thoughts to his thoughts. Don't you understand that God's whole intent, the reason why he sent his son Jesus to die for us on the cross for our sins, it was so that he could reconcile the world back to himself. It was for reconciliation. It was to be restored so that he could have relationship with his people again. He's all about reconciliation. He's all about restoration. And not just in my life, but in the lives of other people that he connects us to. And so we have to be those that are makers of peace. The ones who value and prize and prioritize peace above everything else. We learned in our lesson that even when it's time to confront someone or when there's a, a situation or a matter that we, we really need to make sure we get on the same page, maybe there's a, a sticky situation, we learn that there's something called carefrontation, right? That doesn't mean that you still go and, and, and just, you know, loud them out and say, well, here's what I think about what you did and, and this is what I want you to do and we can't be friends anymore. And, this, and, and then you're in a public place and you're just <laughs> going down the line just reading them their rights, right? That's not what he's called us to do. 
carefrontation means that I'm going to even lovingly approach you. Even if there's something that we need to get right between us, my approach is everything. How I handle the situation is everything. I'm asking God to come into this situation so that we can be reconciled as brothers. I don't want this thing lingering over us anymore. We've got to find a way to make peace. It means that sometimes we have to give up our personal preferences, our right to be right. We can't get so lost in the argument that it's like, well, I've got to drive my point home. I don't care who else I'm driving out and in the process. I don't care if we never speak again. It can't be that way. It should always be with the mind for reconciliation. It should always be believing the best about somebody else. It's always about extending grace to someone else. Because guess what? All of us are on the same journey towards spiritual formation. All of us want to be more like God. All of us want to make heaven our home, right? So if I approach the, uh, my brother and my sister with that understanding that, you know what? It's not you. It's not me. But there's something that the enemy is trying to drive a wedge in between us. He's trying to disturb our peace. Why? So that we can get distracted and we don't focus on the real enemy, which is Satan. And he can continue driving this wedge between us so that we're no longer effective in the kingdom. That's his whole goal. But the devil is a liar. Hallelujah to God. So I'm going to prioritize peace over everything. Like we see with Abram. He gave up his right to choose. He said, you know what? I'm, I'm confident in this promise that I have from God, that if I go ahead and let you have and say, you just go and do what you need to do, and I'm going to be right here. And he might have been looking around because, again, they were fighting because there was a lot of, there was no room for their herds to dwell together. The, the, the sheep and, and, and cattle were just eating up everything. You know, when you, over, um, when you over abuse a piece of land and you have most farmers and people that tend to animals know you've got to migrate your, your, your flocks every now and again so that that ground can have a chance to, to get back right and to get its nutrients and so it can continue producing. And if you keep on letting them graze, you're just going to have hard stubble and dry ground. So he understood that. So he may have been looking around saying, man, this is what I was left with. <laughs> But then the Lord had showed him, no, no, I want you to take a look even further out. All of this, as far as you can see from the west and the east, the north and the south, all of this is going to be yours. Go ahead and start walking around in it because I've already given it to you. And that's the promise that God has given to his people. We're going to be better off and more enriched if we just follow his plan and understand he's the one with the promise. And he does not renege on the promises that he makes. We have to surrender our preferences in favor of forming ourselves into the image of Christ so that we can fulfill God's mission of reconciling the world back to himself. There was a sermon by Brother Joel Urshan, and we got a chance to hear that um, coming back from Bot, and, and the message was played here at the church as well, but it was called the fruitful vine. And he's mentioned in that message that the world is hungry for fruit. They're looking for fruit what are you bearing? What, what are you producing? They're looking for fruit. Our seed of evangelism, revival and harvest is found in the fruit of peace. If we really want to see revival take place like we know it can, when we've been praying for this and we've been asking God to bring in the harvest, he's not going to do that in an atmosphere where there's chaos. They're coming out of confusion. They're coming out of some things that they never thought they'd slip into. And the last thing they're going to need when they look in that house of God in the church is to see more confusion. We need to be the peace dealers. You've got prodigals, prodigal sons and daughters that have been hurt by war and strife in the church. There are people who are left the church because of the foolishness going on inside the church. They've been so hurt and so beat down that they're like, I don't even want anything to do with it anymore. So if we're going to win the prodigals back, and these that have been church hurt, we're going to have to figure out a way that we can let them return to a church where there's peace, where there's acceptance, where there's an extension of grace that says, maybe you don't look the way that I do, and maybe you don't quite have it all together, but guess what? Neither do I. So if we can extend some grace to each other, if we can extend some grace to each other, and I can believe the best about you. And guess what? I can give you the benefit of the doubt. I don't have to just automatically switch the offense button. I don't have to do that. Because we're on this same journey together. We're serving the same God. And we're trying to both make heaven our home. So guess what? As much as it lies within me, the Bible says that we are to be at peace with all men. 
As much as it lies in me, we are to make peace with all men. All men. That means if I have anything to do with it, if there's anything that I can possibly contribute to this effort of peace, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. Don't you know we live in a culture that celebrates war, strife, and wrath? In fact, there's a term used in the news world that if it bleeds, it leads. I don't care about all the feel-good stories you can have out there. Somebody could have rescued a little girl from an oncoming train. You're not going to hear about that. But you're going to hear about the latest salacious gossip. You're going to hear about who committed espionage. You're going to hear about all these things. And it's just whatever is the most offensive, in-your-face, loud, obnoxious, that's what's going to be on the news. That's what you're going to hear the majority of. You really have to dig through social media to find those posts about, you know, just wanted to share some good news or just, you know, wanted to show you, you know, kittens playing with string. You know, just (laughs) anything that's going to brighten your day. Like, you really have to dig for that stuff, right? Because what's in your face is all the fights and the, you know, world star nation, all this. Where's the peace? Our, our nation is hungry for it. Our world is hungry for it. People seem to be living on the edge, and anxiety has pushed them to unreasonable behavior at times. We can look in the news, and even when you see some of these viral posts that have gone, and, and you see people acting badly on airplanes, right? Like they've just gone full Karen, right? And they're just screaming and just, ah, no, no. And then they have to be restrained, you know, and they get a couple licks in while they're holding them down, you know. And then what happens? They get escorted off the plane. Or if it's mid-flight, now the flight has to be diverted to some other non-scheduled destination. And now people on the plane are all inconvenienced behind this. And the person doesn't even seem to realize that even though they gave them a piece of their mind and they said it was on their chest and they gave vent to all that frustration, now they're on the no-fly list. Now they can't get a flight if they wanted to. And what if your job requires you to travel extensively? What if you're a a national sales representative or something, and now you're in the car, beep, beep, every place you go. You you can't even get on a plane anymore. And they don't think about the consequences of their actions. They don't think about in that moment, what have I lost? What am I losing? What am I giving up? And the enemy does not show you that when you're giving vent to your feelings. We don't see the fact that We've now cut down a loved one. We've injured a child. We've spoken in anger. And maybe sometimes, and and, and I know we get frustrated all the time, especially as parents, you know, there's so much going on and you're pulled in so many different directions. And maybe you just spoke a quick, harsh word at your child and you didn't even look back to see how their face just fell. You didn't look back to see how that damaged them. Or to a spouse, angry words exchanged in the heat of an argument. And now you can't take those words back. And now there's all this repair work you've got to do because you gave vent in that moment to your feelings. And the enemy does not show us the cleanup. He does not show us the damage. Or maybe it's a coworker and you gave vent to your feelings. And there was another coworker over here that you've been witnessing to diligently. And you've been trying to invite them to church. But they watched how you lost your cool with this person over here. And now all that groundwork that you've laid is gone. And now you've got to try to repair and rebuild But God is calling us to be peacemakers. Maybe it's a social media post that you made or shared where you gave vent to a particular soapbox issue of yours. Maybe there was something that you posted or a comment that you replied to someone else's post. And by the time you look, that whole post has become so contentious. And there's so much back and forth. And you're like, whoa, let me back out. (laughs) Because this took a turn I wasn't expecting. And we talked about this during our life group lessons, that how we show up to the public, how we show up online, how we show up, that's going to speak to whether we're a peacemaker or we're one of the rabble-rousers. Or one of the people that, I don't really care what anybody thinks. I'm just going to say what I feel. And I'm, I'm just giving you a piece of my mind. I'm just telling you that that's not what we're called to do. That's not what we're called to. And we've got to lay aside some of that worldly thinking, the way that the world responds to things and how we have developed our habits around some of these things that we see going on in the world. We're not in the world. We're in the world, but we're not of this world. We are not of this world. So their ways of handling things are not going to be God's ways of handling things. And these should not be things that we put into our tool bag that we're going to use 
because it's not reflective of the God that we serve. We are to be peacemakers. The world needs to see a peaceful people, and they should be able to see that in the church. In the church. There shouldn't be more peace at the school board meeting than there is in the church. There, there shouldn't be more peace, you know, down the street at this other club or place than there is in the church. You find people getting along together very well, even in certain industries, and they don't necessarily have to be saved, but definitely when it comes to peace, that's one of the fruits of the Spirit. And we need to take that on and cultivate that fruit so that we can become more like Christ. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 33 and it says, for as the churning of milk produces butter and wringing the nose produces blood, so the forcing of wrath produces strife. Let's read that from the NIV. And it says, for as churning cream produces butter and as twisting the nose produces blood, so stirring up anger produces strife. There's some agitation that has to happen. And the Bible tells us plain that we can be angry, but we sin not. So, yes, we can be angry about some things, but we don't need to get to a point where we're just stirring things around and things are just stewing inside of us. And we've dwelt on that thing and it's festered so much and now it's become a root of bitterness. And now it's something heavy like a stone that we're walking around with. And we can't even get past it to do the things that God has called us to do because that stone is just sitting right here. Just as you do all these things, if you're trying to make butter, there's a lot of churning that goes into that. And your arms, I mean, man, it's a workout all in its own. And think about how much when we give vent to our anger and we let that thing continue to churn and stir. And it's working overtime. And we're exhausted. It's exhausting. It is exhausting to put that type of effort into something that is not of God. It is exhausting. And the ringing of the nose produces blood. You twist your nose good enough and hard enough, you can get some blood out of that. you got to do a lot of ringing in order to do that. But that's what that strife does, that anger does. We know what anger produces. It produces strife. But Jesus calls us to peace, to be more like him. Being a peacemaker doesn't make us weak. We know through Christ we're made stronger in our weakness, but being a peacemaker opens us up to experience an altar of peace in our lives. It gives us the opportunity to renew God's promises in our lives. Just like with Abraham, as soon as he made peace with Lot, the Lord opened up and revealed to him even more about the promises that he was bringing into his life. Because he took that step of peace, because he had prioritized peace, and the Lord says, I can work with that. I see some changes since you slipped over there into Egypt and you wavered for just a bit, but now you're back at Bethel at the house of God. And now you've made peace with Lot and you've moved him on. And now it's just you and me the way I intended it to be. Now let me share some more with you. How much do we miss hearing from the Lord because we are not in the place where we've made peace with the people around us. So there's chaos and confusion going on. So he can't even speak to our minds and give us the next set of instructions because we're so locked into whatever battle or whatever contention that we're struggling with. When we can just make peace and open up the windows of heaven so that God can pour out blessings on us that we won't have room enough to receive. For the sake of that alone, we should be quick to make peace. Hey, hey, what, what, what can we do to work this out? Oh, wait, wait, hold on. There's a problem over here. Hold on. We got to run to it. We got to get on it. Because if we don't, it tends to let things stew and fester longer than they should. And these promises that the Lord has made to us can only be renewed and it can only happen when we choose peace over strife and anger. Being a peacemaker doesn't mean that you lost a dispute. It means peace takes priority in your life. I don't have to be right on everything. I can know internally that I'm right, and I can just wait for you to get that revelation as well, but I'm going to be over here enjoying my peace. I don't have to sit there and push the point 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 and push the point. Push the point. No, because I prioritize peace over all of that. Not every disagreement at work has to end with someone getting fired or quitting their job. Not every rough patch in a marriage has to end in separation and or divorce. Not every dispute has to end in anger, wrath, and regret. There doesn't have to be winners and losers. We can both win when we choose to prioritize peace over our preferences. Peace over having the last word. Peace over my right to be right. 
I prioritize peace over all of that. We're not weak or wrong or naive or short-sighted, nor do we lack conviction if we do not continually argue and fight. Have you all ever been around people, they just always have something going? They are the messiest people. They just don't even know what peace even feels like because they just always are stirring something up. It doesn't make us less passionate about our cause. It doesn't make us unwilling to defend that cause. We've simply chosen peace because we're that confident in the peace speaker. We're that confident in the promises that God has made for us. That you know what? Above everything else, my peace is prioritized because that's his will. And I want to make sure that I'm reconciled to my brother. Because if I can't be reconciled with my brother, how am I going to be reconciled to God? How can I influence him being reconciled back to God if I can't even get it together with the two of us? Abraham understood that he had a promise from God. And so he could confidently allow Lot to choose whatever place he wanted to occupy without worrying that his promise would be in jeopardy. Sometimes we're struggling to hold on to things that God has already promised us. And if we have it settled in our spirit that it already belongs to us, I don't have to fight with nobody over it. Because what God gave, they can't take it from me. They can try, but I don't have to stress myself out trying to keep it when it's a promise that he made to me. Choosing peace isn't compromise. It is a deliberate, intentional pursuit of God's will for reconciliation. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, and it says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. King James says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Our pursuit of peace goes hand in hand with pursuing holiness. Did y'all know that? It goes hand in hand with pursuing holiness. You can't be holy, like I said, in a rabble rouser. You can't be a lover of peace, but the messiest, most drama-filled person in the room. There are things that we do not compromise on. We don't compromise on this doctrine. We don't compromise on the necessity of the baptism in Jesus' name and the infilling of the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. These are things we don't compromise on. Salvation, biblical truths, but not every gray area has to end in dispute. Some things can just be gray. Gray is a color. It's okay. There doesn't have to be a winner and a loser. The old saying goes, pick your battles. And the other saying says, you don't have to die on every hill. You don't have to, everything is, oh, it's just, I gotta, no. <laughs> some things just give it up. Just let it go. For the sake of peace. Now, there are some things I'm going to put my foot down and I'm going to stand firm and plant it on the word of God. But there are other things it's like, you know what? We'll just let it go. In my closing, Jesus indeed said something similarly, seemingly contradictory to the doctrine of peace. Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 36. And you can stand with me as we're closing out. He says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Verse 35 says, for I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. And what this passage of scripture, because it seems a little contradictory, right? That he didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. But what this is saying is that the gospel will divide families. And in the end times will cause betrayal. And why is that? Because the gospel will be presented to all. And each person will have to decide for themselves if they will accept or reject the gospel. We all have a decision to make. You will be in one camp or the other, but you will have to make a choice. And that choice will mean, in some cases, the dividing of families. But the gospel is still the gospel of peace for those who will gladly receive it. And some of us that have received this new birth experience, we know not everyone in our family gets it. Not everyone understands that we've been brought out of darkness into the marvelous light. And we don't ostracize family members. We don't cut people off or anything like that. But some people just, their, their eyes haven't been opened yet. They have not been able to see truth yet. And we still love them and we pray for them. But we don't have to get contentious over this. Because the Lord is the one, the spirit of the Lord gives us revelation. And all we can do is just pray and say, God, reveal truth to them, Lord.
in your own time, God, and in your own way. But the best thing that we can do, like we learned about in our, in our life group sessions, the scripture that tells us that we are living epistles, known and read among men. We may be the only Bible that they'll ever read, and they're reading our lives. They're reading our conversation, our manner of living. And what is that saying to them? What are we displaying for them? Are we, are we upholding some sort of a self-righteous attitude, like I'm better than you? Or that, you know, I've got it all together because I chose this walk and, and you haven't made that choice yet? No. We're to be peacemakers. And Jesus, with all of his authority, he submitted and humbled himself to the death on the cross. And if he did that for us, how much more can we extend grace to others? And how much more should we strive to be peacemakers? It's not an easy thing. Some people think that being a peacemaker simply means that you lay down and you just let everybody walk all over you and you don't have any opinion at all. That's not what this is. What it is is a humble submission to the will of God for my life. It's counseling with the Lord. Lord, how do you want me to handle this situation? It's building altars frequently, building an altar of peace in our own lives. And it starts with asking the Lord, Lord, search my heart and know me. And if there be any way in me that is not like you, God, show me. Lord God, I want your help. Remove it, God, from me. So that I can follow peace with all men, knowing that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I want an altar of peace in my home. This, this should be a place that we can come to and all the outside world is shut out and there's peace in my home. And guess what this morning? If there's not peace in your home, you have the power to declare a thing like we started out this message saying with the songs that we're singing. We declare your glory. We declare your healing. We declare your wholeness. And you can walk up and down in your home and you can change the atmosphere in your home. And before you know it, where once there was tension and chaos and confusion, now there can be peace because my spirit can control the atmosphere. When you walk into your job, and I was talking to Sister Octavia, and she said that she has done this. You get to that office early. If there's stuff going on in that office, you get to that office real early. And get you some anointing oil. You just start anointing that desk and anointing that computer and anointing that chair and anointing that door. Make it a slip and slide in there if you have to. But I promise you, your coworkers, when they come in, they'll be like, feel something. Wow. Something has changed. I don't, I don't even know what it is. I just, it just feels, feels good in here. <laughs> it's not essential oils. It's not any of that stuff. It's the power of the Holy Ghost going in there, going before you. When you get in that meeting or you're talking to that person that's normally contentious, and instead of allowing that thing to rise up in you, you can say, mm -mm, I speak peace. I speak peace. God, you've called me to be a peacemaker. I'm going to go out of my way. If I know that there's something that's not quite right in a relationship that I have with someone, I'm going to go out of my way to figure out how can we make this thing better? How can we get to the, to the, to the issue at hand and get that resolved so that we can be reconciled? Because he wants to reconcile the world back to himself. We want to be reconciled back to God and be in relationship with him. And the only way that we can do that is if we make it our business to be peacemakers. That's what the world is looking for. That's what they're needing more now than ever. And I wonder this morning if, if anyone would like to come to the altar to pray and just build a personal altar of peace. Maybe there's been some chaos in my home. Maybe there's been some confusion in my mind going on. God, I need your peace. And peace has to start with me. Peace has to start with me. I can't expect this infusion of peace to come from the outside when there may be a whole lot of chaos going on inside. I've got to do the work. We want to pray for boldness this morning. God, let us be willing to do the work. Give us the, the, the boldness that we need, God, to be honest with ourselves and about what we see part in things because sometimes we don't want to we don't want to say what our part was in the mess right we just know that there's mess but we don't want to say what our part was in the mess the devil is a lie 
go ahead and confess it. Get out in front of it and make it right. God, it's starting with me. I was the one, like I was churning some butter, <laughs> stirring up strife and stirring up conflict. I could have let that thing go a long time ago, but I just kept. <sighs> God, help me to surrender my need to be right, to surrender my will to yours, my preferences, God. Let me lay those on the altar of peace, God, that I want to build this morning in your presence. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we honor your spirit, God. We honor your presence, oh God, in the name of Jesus. And I pray this morning, oh God, that someone, Lord God, will just take the courage, Lord God, to examine themselves, oh God, in the name of Jesus, to see, Lord God, those things that may lie in us, oh God, that are not according to your will. Things, oh God, that would keep us, Lord, from inheriting the rest of the promise that you have for us, Lord. Until we can get to a place of peace, in our minds, God, I speak peace, Lord God, over every mind, Lord God, in this sanctuary, God. I speak peace, Lord, to the hearts of your people, God. Something has been stirred up inside of us, God. And I pray for your peace, oh God, that peace that only comes from you, that does not come from the world. God, the world doesn't understand it, but Lord God, we have it and we need it, God, in the name of Jesus. Lord God, stir something up in us, Lord. Lord, that this week, God, in our homes, this week on our jobs, God, there's going to be a change, Lord, because there's going to be an infusion of peace, God. Hallelujah, God. We bless you this morning, God, and we give you praise in the name of Jesus.
this morning we are at the close of our service and we just appreciate the Lord thank you to all of our guests and visitors that took time out of your schedule to be with us amen let's give them a hand glory to God here at City Church we just love you we're a family and if you're a family looking for a family we're a family looking for you <laughs> amen and we do have if there's anyone that wants to be baptized in Jesus name we do have a few things that we need to do with our baptistry but if you wanted to come back this week because we don't want to deny anyone a chance to be baptized in the saving name of Jesus but we will have the pool ready during this week and so if you'll make contact with the church you can contact myself or you can leave a message on the church voicemail but if you would like to be baptized we will make it a point to come back out and make sure that you are taken care of in Jesus name amen now please go and deliver your children from the Sunday school teachers <laughs> deliver the teachers from the students yes and then also those who are interested in our connect groups for the summer please see pastor right over here in pastor's little corner here and he will meet with you but we want to have an enjoyable time of fellowship this summer so please come if you have ideas about um, a connect group or if you want to find out how to be connected or involved please come and meet with him just for a few minutes amen 